Greetings. My name is Ian Taylor. I'm a director here at Flojo. And today, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Today, I am going to be talking to you about uh, SeatGeek, one of our latest analysis platforms uh, released. Um, I have listed here SeatGeek version 1.3. We actually have a newer version available now, uh, SeatGeek version 1.4. This slide deck just hasn't been updated yet, but I will go through a brief live demo of SeatGeek version 1.4 uh, and merging your flow data with single cell RNA seq data uh, after this brief um, slide deck. So again, just to get started, my name's Ian. You can reach me after this uh, webinar at taylor at flojo.com. There's also question and answer available uh, within the Zoom um, application itself and a chat window. So feel free to write in um, and interrupt me while I'm talking. I'd be happy to, to cover your questions live um, as they pop up. So without further ado, let's dig into uh, SeekGeek, our single cell RNA sequencing data analysis software. In case you need further help after the webinar, again, you can always write to me taylor at flojo.com, but you can also get some self-help if you want by going to our manual uh, documentation, which is at docs.flojo.com forward slash SeatGeek. Um, the Flojo website is available uh, with lots of different uh, help for whatever platform you're using, flojo.com forward slash solutions. And then if you're looking for SeatGeek, um, there's a specific uh, section for that as well. We also have webinars and Flojo University available at that site. And this webinar will be uh, uploaded there shortly after this presentation. So look forward to that if you need a refresher. You can also write to tech support, seekgeek at flojo.com, or give us a call and we'll be happy to help you uh, with any questions or problems you might have during your analysis. Overview of what I'm going to be talking about today, just to begin with, um, the seekgeek workspace, sort of the ba basic starting point of any analysis. So if you're familiar with Flojo, this should look somewhat, um, this should look familiar. Uh, it's the workspace for SeatGeek. So essentially we have tabs, we have um, ribbons, we have the gene sets area, which is a little bit different than what you would normally see in Flojo there at the top of the workspace. Um, we also have an area for samples or uh, groups and samples. So this is where you're going to do uh, most of the work uh, in analysis, at least to begin with. Uh, there's also discovery tools available there, including dimensionality reduction, which is a key starting point to any or most single cell RNA-seq analyses. Um, you can perform downsampling. There's a dimensionality reduction platform vector inspector. So if you want to look at the contributing parameters to principal components. Um, and there's also quality control, which we would highly suggest you um, utilize for your analysis. Within the uh, preferences, there's all sorts of different settings that you can change within SeatGeek if you want to change the defaults. And this is available by clicking on the little red heart icon in the top right hand corner of SeatGeek's workspace. First step is probably going to be importing your data uh, from wherever you have it stored. And we do support drag and drop import of data. So if you just have a CSV file that represents your expression matrix, you can drag and drop it from your desktop or any folder on your machine directly into the workspace. And it should load there just as you see here. You can also click the add samples button or you can load directly from base space if your data is stored in that platform um, for further analysis in SeatGeek. We also have plugins in SeatGeek and it's important to be aware of these early um, because if you want to use them in downstream analysis, you need to have them set up. Many of these plugins uh, require connection to R and in order to set that connection up, you'll need to visit the SeatGeek preferences and specifically the diagnostics section there where you can enter your R path. And here you see the default R path for a Mac computer. It'll be different for Windows. Um, again, if you have any questions, I would, I would recommend write to SeatGeek at flojo.com and we can assist you with this connection as it can be a little bit tricky, especially for people that are not um, used to dealing with R. And then you'll also need to point SeatGeek to your plugins directory, which you can see in this case is just on my desktop. And this is where you're gonna store jar files that are associated with each of the plugins. Um, and of course, to get the plugins and the associated documentation associated with them, you would just visit exchange.flojo.com. So this is another really great resource to have uh, if you're playing with the plugins. 
and each of the plugins has their own set of documentation that will illustrate a little bit of how you install the plugin, the different dependencies that are required in R, and then also how to use those plugins effectively. If you have installed plugins and everything is looking good, um, this is what you should see when you visit the workspace tab in uh, SeatGeek's workspace and then click on the plugins section. You can see I've got a bunch of different plugins available to me here, um, which I can click on in order to run them on this particular, particular data set I've loaded. This happens to be the 6,000 PBMCs um, that we have available as demo data if you download the SeatGeek software. And I would highly recommend you download it and get a 60 day trial if you haven't played around with it already. Um, pretty fun software. Uh, in order to begin your analysis, oftentimes you'll want to open up a graph window. And this is uh, just as simple as double clicking on a, a sample or a population. And you can see we're able to visualize different parameters within that space. Um, we can also subset our parameters into what we call gene sets, which will be listed at the top of the various X and Y wings there. And you can also change the, the plot type. The scaling is all available for change uh, or customization in the T button next to either axis. Here's the one for the X axis. Similarly, um, there's a separate view within the graph window, which is called gene view. You can see that it's highlighted here. If we select this button, we will no longer be viewing cells as dots. And instead, we'll be visualizing the different genes as dots. And in that case, um, what we see on the axis is actually a population. Um, so this is really important if you're trying to subset your parameters in a certain way and perhaps find differentially expressed genes, for example. We'll get in, in deeper detail in that further, but I just want to introduce you to this extra um, view within the graph window in SeatGeek as this is not something that's available currently in Flojo. So the gene view where we visualize the genes expression per population as opposed to the cells uh, expression uh, per, per gene. Um, and here's another kind of illustration of how that works. So we have a, a data matrix here in which we have different populations defined by these geometric uh, gates for these two different parameters. But if we sort of transpose that uh, data matrix, we look like this, where we have different genes um, essentially behaving as the cells from our previous matrix, and we have populations behaving as the parameters with regard to those different, um, what will become dots in the display. And you can see the, the genes that are overexpressed in cluster two are gonna be found somewhere in this region, and the genes overexpressed in cluster one or parameters overexpressed in cluster one will be found in this region of that gene view graph window. So hopefully that's clear, um, but this can be a little bit confusing, especially for first time users. So please do feel free to reach out if you have questions about how this works. The gene sets that you create by gating in the gene view are gonna be available at the top of the workspace. You can see here's a sort of complicated uh, list of gene sets that we've defined, some coming from uh, different databases and some being defined by geometric gates within the gene view. So there are a variety of different gene sets uh, which can be imported and exported uh, using SeatGeek. Next, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, quality control, since that's probably gonna be the next step you'll wanna do, and then dimensionality reduction. So the quality control uh, available in SeatGeek is multifaceted. One uh, option that many people will want to run before doing any further analysis is the SC Impute plugin, which is one of those plugins that relies on R. And what this does is it helps to impute dropout events so in single cell RNA sequencing data, uh, you, may be, you may be familiar, there are many events that are uh, counted as a zero. In other words, there were no reads detected, but are actually uh, non-zero. And so there are a variety of tools available out there, different algorithms that can help you to impute those dropout events and change the uh, expression values that you utilize. So it's a, a type of normalization that you'd wanna perform before doing downstream analysis um, if you were gonna try and do um, dropout imputation. There's also a quality control button or platform within the analyze tab in the discovery band uh, of SeatGeek's workspace. And if you click that, um, this is a little bit old, you're actually gonna get three different graph windows, which we'll illustrate um, in the live demo in a, in a moment. But those three windows are gonna give you new parameters in both uh, cell view and in gene view. 
And essentially what you're able to do with these new parameters is remove outlier events that could be doublets. So these are obviously events that have a very high uh, total read per cell and also are expressing many, many genes per cell. So we wanna remove those um, via this quality cells gate or a similar gate. If you had control populations that had you know, known uh, multiple cells, we could also remove those um, or known empty wells, you could also remove those. In some experiments, you'll have those controls already in place. Um, you can also remove uh, genes that are being overexpressed in a quality genes gate, such as this one. Um, we're also removing dimly expressed genes. Now, why do we do this? Well, in the case of dimly expressed genes, they're not going to contribute a lot in terms of the clustering that we're going to do uh, downstream, at least for this particular population. We will want to go back and repeat this quality con control step um, if we were starting to dig into um, subpopulations within a given uh, sample. But for now, we're going to remove those genes that are not contributing much uh, in terms of um, expression. So only you can see if only a few cells are actually expressing these genes. Similarly, we're going to remove uh, the genes that are being expressed by all the cells. Those are going to wind up being pretty boring genes. Again, just in terms of this population that we have selected, which is the raw sample in this case. Um, and so we do want to remove those. Later, I'll show you, we also want to mainly include those genes that are contributing lots of variants um, to the data set, because those are going to be the ones that cluster um, nicely in biological space. Another method of quality control is to remove um, those cells that are expressing highly in mitochondrial uh, genes. And so what we can do is set up a gene set um, that contains only mitochondrial genes and remove the, uh, in this case, 3.7% uh, that are expressing the highest amount uh, of mitochondrial genes and, and make sure that all of these cells are happy and, and healthy cells um, that aren't expressing too many mitochondrial genes that might indicate some damage to the cell or, or actually death. Next, dimensionality reduction. Um, so dimensionality reduction means you're taking a, a huge matrix, maybe tens of thousands of parameters and compressing it down into a smaller but much more um, uh, richly, uh, uh, excuse me, non-sparse matrix, I suppose you'd say. Um, and so oftentimes what we wanna do is just include all of the genes of interest. Um, these could be your quality genes. Um, and in this case, you can see I'm just removing some categorical parameters that exist in this data set. Um, these are malignant, uh, non-malignant cell types, and then tumor or patient ID uh, from this particular data set, thus leaving only the genes behind, which is going to be a huge number in this case, almost 24,000 uh, different parameters that are going to go into our principal component analysis. So uh, if you're not familiar with principal component analysis, it's a, a pretty simple way of doing dimensionality reduction. And it's going to give you back um, some number of principal components um, that are just parameters that describe a higher dimensionality um, data space or manifold. After having run principal component analysis on your given set of parameters, Seekeek will go ahead and display the first two principal components describing the widest uh, amount of variance within the data set. And you can see in this case, this is actually a melanoma data set that comes as a uh, demo data with SeekGeek when you download it. You can see we get some really nice separation just within the first two principal components um, immediately. And if we do this trick of color mapping um, by a tertiary parameter, in this case, we use the categorical uh, malignant, which was determined by flow cytometry analysis. We can see that malignant cells, uh, which have a value of two turn up uh, bright red, and those that are uh, have a value of one turn out bright green, those are the ones that are non-malignant. So we have our non-malignant, possibly like T cells, B cells, and K cells here, and then a nice cluster of either unknown in blue or uh, known malignant cells in red here. But this is actually telling us a lot more about the global differences across the data set than it is about um, subsets within that. And so we may want to move on to other methods of dimensionality reduction, such as T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, or T-SNE. And in this case, um, T-SNE actually works better running on a, uh, a dense matrix, which is what you get from the principal component analysis. So it's very convenient to run the principal component um, dimensionality reduction prior to running T-SNE and then utilize those principal components you've developed within the uh, T-SNE mapping or, or visualization, I should say.
So here you can see I've chosen the first six principal components to run TCE on. Um, this is just selecting the parameters. And then once it's visualized, we can actually color map by the non-malignant cell type. So getting some, some deeper in insight into these cells. Those that are blue are actually our tumor cells. You can see they cluster together um, kind of nicely. And then our other cells, including B cells and T cells, are uh, distinct in their own separate um, islands within the TSNE visualization. Shouldn't call them clusters because we haven't actually done clustering here except by the, um, the flow cytometry data uh, or the analysis that was done ahead of time. You can also see that this, uh, these new set of parameters, both the TSNE parameters and the principal components, are all contained um, conveniently in this new gene set the analytical parameters gene set within the graph window there. So they're easy to find. Clustering. Um, so there are actually new clustering tools that are in our newest release. Um, I'll show those a little bit in the live presentation after this slide deck. But the clustering tools such as gating, um, auto gating, and the Surat plugin are all also available. Uh, it's debatable whether or not this gating tool is actually true clustering, um, but it's what we're used to. In, in flow cytometry data analysis. Again, those that have used Flojo will be familiar with these different tools, um, including a, we have a pencil tool here. You can draw simple polygons, uh, ellipse gates, rectangles, and quadrants. Um, and those are all good for finding different populations within potentially uh, individual gene parameters or within dimensionally reduced space um, where we're just gating on the islands coming out of the TSNE uh, run that we just completed. Uh, I didn't mention the auto gate, but this is actually a really handy one. It's a little bit less biased in that it draws its gating based on contour lines uh, or essentially on density. And so here I've just uh, created different subpopulations. We don't know yet what they are biologically, uh, but using the auto gate tool alone. You can see it missed a few cells in this larger population, but we were able to find some other clusters just based on uh, density. So that's that's really handy and a lot of people we find are looking for some unbiased clustering tools and so that's probably the first one I would show. Another is the Surat plugin. Now Surat, uh, I have to give a huge shout out to the Satija lab at NYU who developed this pipeline in R uh, and does a beautiful job um, of completing a whole series of steps um, and it's free. You can go to the exchange, uh, exchange.fojo.com to download the plugin, uh, again free of charge. Uh, you can also utilize the plugin directly in R following instructions from this lab um, that I mentioned. But they have uh, implemented a, a way of doing uh, quality control, dimensionality reduction, unbiased clustering based on a k-nearest neighbors algorithm, uh, and then doing differential expression on those k-nearest neighbors uh, clustering, all in essentially one package. Uh, so that's really, really cool. Uh, a lot of people find that really handy, at least to begin with. Um, Sometimes it is nice to be able to subset uh, or pick a certain subset of interest and then do further finer clustering on it. But I'll, I'll talk about that at the end of this uh, slide deck. So that's another method of unbiased clustering that's really popular. Differential expression uh, of genes filtering is probably gonna be your next step as you begin to ask sort of what parameters make these different clusters uh, unique among my data set. And so in order to start to visualize that, what we do is open up the gene view. Notice. Um, I can get my cursor. Gene view here is highlighted within the graph window. And so each of these dots we know represents a different parameter within the data set. And the two populations I'm looking at here are population one and a not gate that I've renamed, um, a not gate of population one that I've renamed everything else. So this population is just uh, representing the normalized expression of genes relative to a, a population one that we saw from a few slides back. Here, so population one. So that's the one we're looking at. Population one is our test population and everything else is our control population. And if we go ahead and click this differential expression button here, it'll open up a volcano plot. And what's really cool about a volcano plot is it gives us a way of determining uh, statistically significant genes or parameters within this data set. Um, and essentially the way it does that is it does a comparison, a statistical comparison between our test and control populations. And the two comparisons it makes are fold change, which are placed, which is placed on the X axis. So here's the fold change of population one versus everything else. And then we also get a measure of significance, specifically an adjusted P value, also called a Q value uh, on the Y axis, which is again, 
the adjusted p-value of population one versus everything else. For any bioinformaticians who might be watching this, uh, the test that we're actually performing is a Man Whitney U test to get our p-values, and then we do a uh, Bonferroni correction on top of that. The dotted line here shows a typical significance that someone might set, so it's just a suggestion. Some people might want to set their uh, reproducibility threshold or, or uh, significance threshold slightly uh, more stringent, which would be up in this inverse log scale, so more towards the zero and away from one, which would be statistically insignificant. Um, and then full change, again, is something that each researcher may have a different preference on. Oftentimes we find people setting a threshold at two or maybe 1.5, somewhere in here, um, in terms of the full change of parameters in your two comparison populations. Here's another way of uh, setting that gate. Um, you can use just your normal gating tools. So uh, I usually use a rectangle gate, but you can use a polygon or the pencil tool. Um, but you can also, in the graph tab of this graph window, choose to manually enter a gate. And in there, you can set the lower and upper thresholds for both your full change and your p-value. And it will create a rectangle gate um, based on those thresholds. So you don't have to manually find the exact location um, where you want to set your your thresholds for significance and full change. Once we've completed this, um, you can see we're looking at possibly some B cells in this case. I'm not quite sure where this data set is coming from, but in any case, um, we're looking at the up B cells. So anything with a positive full change is considered upregulated, and anything with a negative full change is considered downregulated. So those are our downregulated B cell uh, genes. And we're gonna inspect those a little bit here. Um, when you've created a gene set, you can actually treat that gene set as a parameter in and of itself. So let me explain a little bit. In the uh, graph window on the left, this is cell view. Both of these plots are cell view. In the graph window on the left, we're actually illustrating um, gene sets on the X and Y axis. So here we see those genes that were determined to be upregulated in B cells and genes that were downregulated in B cells. So that would make these single positives are upregulated positive and downregulated negative cells, if that makes sense. And we've called those up B cell positive, down B cell negative. And just overlay that with um, the rest of the, the singlet that we identified in this data set. If we then look at parameters coming from flow cytometry, we can actually confirm that these gene sets worked to pick out the B cells by looking at CD19 uh, positive, CD3 negative. So that's kind of a cool illustration of how gene sets can work to help you identify phenotypes um, once you have some confidence that your gene sets um, are good for a given model. So that gets us into gene set enrichment analysis. Um, and this might help us to determine uh, what a given um, unknown population is representing in terms of some biological question. So again, um, it requires a gene set library or essentially a set of gene sets with which we want to compare an unknown gene set. And it compares genes of interest with a library. Um, and it's used to infer some biological state using uh, Fisher's exact test, which just checks based on the number of genes that we have or the, the genes available in the model, how good does the unknown gene set match the library of gene sets or any one of those library of gene sets. In order to run this in SeekGeek, you'll first need to have a gene set library, which I kind of skip over that step, but you can see I have a particular um, human B cell uh, gene set library here, this .gmt file that I've selected. Um, in order to run enrichment, the enrichment test in SeekGeek, you're simply going to right click on a gene set and then choose enrichment test. From there, you'll be prompted to select your model. The model can just be your sample because that's going to contain all the features or genes, parameters uh, available in that data set currently, and then your library. So again, I was already confident that we were subsetting B cells in this case uh, and looking at differential expression within each of those subsets. And then looking at a um, significant p-value for the comparison with B cell gene sets. So just to give you a heads up, this B cell uh, gene set library contains things like naive B cells, memory B cells, plasma B cells, unknown B cells. So every uh, different kind of subset that we could find within the B cell um, clusters in a different data set. And when we run this gene set enrichment analysis, we find that this cluster comes up uh, with a pretty significant p-value of um, 
calling naive B cells. So we might go ahead and um, make the hypothesis that our um, Surat cluster one represents naive B cells in this case. Uh, finally, uh, nearly, nearly through the slide deck, um, ways of exporting information from SeatGeek. One is the layout editor. Now, oftentimes as you're going through an analysis, you'll be adding, uh, you'll be wanting to look at different plots side by side, and this can be a really convenient way to do so. Just as you set up different um, graphs within the graph window, go ahead and drag the populations into the layout editor in order to see those, uh, those visualized in a handy format that you can then export publication quality graphics from. You can also change the graph types within the layout editor. You can look at um, contour plots, density plots, um, zebra plots. There's a whole variety of different um, plotting options available. Um, you can also do import and export of gene sets. I think I mentioned that earlier, but just to, uh, to show you that in this genes tab of the workspace, you can see we've highlighted um, new collection here. There's also the export option. So if you want to take these gene sets into a, another uh, platform or you want to export them for maybe uh, publication purposes, you can do so from this genes tab within SeatGeek. We also have the ability to export subpopulations. So very often people will want to export um, just populations of interest to do downstream analysis with um, and that, or, or possibly take it into R. And that is totally doable. You're just gonna select the populations of interest and then go to export slash concatenate where you'll be able to export individual populations or combine them together into one data matrix um, as you wish. And then some other plugins I wanted to highlight um, in this presentation. The auto categorical gating plugin comes with the install of SeatGeek, so no need to go to the exchange to get that. And it has no dependencies in R, so it will work without any other connections having been set up. And essentially, the way it works is it creates subpopulations based on a categorical parameter. Um, categorical parameter simply being uh, any parameter that contains integer values, so 0, 1, 2, 3, um, four or five, whatever. In this case, uh, I've gone ahead and run this on the 6K PBMCs, which actually contains um, five different samples. And so by running the auto categorical um, gating plugin on the sample ID, I'm able to gate out automatically those five different samples. So you can imagine if your data set contained 30 patients, this is a really handy way to just immediately identify which cells belong to which patients without having to draw 30 gates manually. So that's really, really handy. And we use that a lot. Another really cool plugin um, is the Monocle plugin, which is uh, one of many different tools available out there to do pseudo time prediction or prediction of differential um, tr differentiation trajectories within your data set. Uh, Monocle is actually listed as the third best um, um, pseudo time prediction algorithm out of about, I would say, 20 or 30 in a recent bioarchive um, publication that I could send anyone who's interested. Again, just write to taylor at flojo.com if you have questions for me specifically. Um, and the things that this will output are a number, of, a number of parameters, including some dimensionality reduction. So you get pseudo time X, pseudo time Y. And each of these different branches is a prediction coming from the algorithm for different um, states of differentiation that are going on in this particular data set. And we find this works really well for clustering in homogeneous populations where things like Surat or K nearest neighbors clustering may not do so well at teasing apart the different clusters. And you can see we can actually visualize those different monocle states um, using a color map in this case. And um, I would also note that this monocle state works really well with that auto categorical gating plugin I I mentioned previously where we can gate out these different subpopulations if we then want to do investigation of maybe differential expression. What are these different states, uh, what are these states expressing differentially relative to the rest of the population? And this I should also mention um, another big shout out, the Cole Trapnel Lab actually developed this particular algorithm um, which is reliant uh, as a plugin is reliant on R. Again, uh, the resources I mentioned at the beginning of this slide deck are um, docs.flojo.com forward slash SeatGeek if you want to look at the manual pages for a further description of all the different processes I've walked you through today and more. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a newer release out, so there's new documentation associated with the features that are available in, in that release. 
You could also check out the Flojo website for further help. Flojo.com uh, has the solutions area for each of the different products, but we also have webinars. Some are specific to SeatGeek, some are specific to just plugins in general. Flojo, um, whatever kind of training you need is available there. And you can also always reach out to tech support, SeatGeek at Flojo.com or give us a call and we'll be happy to set up a individual training with you or answer any uh, specific questions you might have with the software. And with that, I think I'll go into a little live demo. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to post those again um, with regard to that presentation or uh, as I go through this live demo. There's a Q&A um, section of the Zoom uh, platform or application as well as a uh, chat window. So just drop those in if you have them. Um, the demo I wanted to give, again, this is in our latest release, so I can show you some of the new features that are available there as of just very recently, the last couple of weeks. Um, the demo I want to show is of merging uh, an expression matrix that was uh, created, you know, doing single cell RNA-seq with flow data that comes from an index sort leading up to that um, single, uh, single cell sequencing. So oftentimes, uh, if you're going to do single cell RNA-seq, you will have done some kind of index sorting to get down to a population of interest um, and picking out the cells that you actually want to perform the sequencing on. And that is the case in a demo data set that we actually provide when you download SeatGeek um, coming from the um, Accelerating Medicines Partnership. Uh, it is lupus data coming from more than 30 different patients suffering from the, the lupus condition, uh, specifically kidney biopsies, along with a few patients that were actually healthy. So we could do a little bit of control um, in that experiment. Uh, so this is a really cool data set and we were actually able to merge the flow data with the um, expression matrix and some meta information coming from the experiment in that case. So when you first download SeatGeek, if you're checking out this data, you'll notice that everything has already been nicely merged for you. But if you've done index sorting yourself and you have an expression matrix associated with a given set of cells, this is just a brief demo to show you kind of how it would work um, to go ahead and merge those, those artifacts. So you can see here, the things I want to focus on are these three data sets. So starting with the lupus kidney expression matrix, I'm going to go ahead and load that into SeatGeek, again, just with a drag and drop option. And we should see that load momentarily. It is rather large, so it'll take a, a little while to load. And then once that's done, I just want to illustrate for you what's in this data set. So I'm going to double click to open the graph window. And within that graph window, you can see a couple of genes are listed here. So we have these genes just starting at the top of the alphabet, the A's. But if I open up, uh, say, our X parameter uh, selector here, or X wing, sometimes we call it, uh, we can see that there are 30,000 different parameters. And it would take me probably all day to scroll through this list, but you can see there's just a gigantic number of features in this data set, which is very cool. But we haven't yet got any flow data in there. And I can prove that to you by just typing in dash flow. So we're searching all of these 30,000 genes for anything that has dash flow in there. Um, and we don't see anything. So that takes us back to this expression, uh, sorry, this, this data matrix, which is flow data with cell IDs. And I just want to illustrate really quickly what that contains by opening this up. Let's see if Excel will open this very quickly. Yep. And you can see that I have a set of parameters contained in columns and different cells in rows within that matrix. This will work either way. Um, CKeq has some really fancy um, sample inference um, that it can do to put the matrix in the correct direction. Um, and if it fails at that, we can always tell it to put parameters in columns using this organization um, piece of meta, metadata that I have in this particular file. The other really important thing to note here, aside from the flow parameters that are, that are available there, is a cell ID. And this cell ID uh, set of values has to match the cell ID values that are contained within this lupus kidney expression matrix. Now, in this case, I already know that they do. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. Now that you've seen what that uh, flow index sorting um, matrix looks like, data matrix, I'm not going to save that. Um, and if I just drag and drop, close this window, you close my presentation as well. If I just drag and drop this flow data right on top of that expression matrix, it should go ahead and merge. And if we double click, we now have these analytical, oh, oh, we didn't get them. Try one more time.
Okay, so now we have analytical parameters, which are coming from the merge. So SeekGeek knows that these parameters are different than the first set that we added, and it puts them in a new gene set within the graph window, which is kind of handy. And we can see we have scatter parameters. We can actually view a couple of those if we want to. So just to show you that they nicely gated these, this data uh, before having um, done the expression, uh, sorry, uh, the sequencing on it. And we might choose to clean this up a little bit. We could gate on the, the densest portion of this if we wanted to, do like a size gate, uh, but I'm not gonna do that because I'm happy with what they've done here. And we also have flow parameters. You can see we have uh, actually 11 different uh, fluorescent uh, channels here, and they all need rescaling. So I might as well just show you that. If I go to customize axis, just like in Flojo, you get a list of all your parameters. And in this case, uh, I wanna find all of those newly merged parameters, which are gonna be at the end of the matrix. And I'm just gonna select all of the fluorescent, the FL parameters here. And I'm gonna to switch to something uh, like a log scale. And we could also go by exponential, but this just keeps it simple and I'll click apply. And now we could maybe do, you know, pan leukocyte versus, I don't know, PI. And we'll start to be able to pull out populations just like you would within flow. And we could draw normal flow gates on these and we could start to get our canonical populations from flow, which is really, really handy because if you've ever done single cell RNA-seq analysis, one of the hardest things is actually making confident cell calls. And of course, that's because by definition, the phenotype of our cells is determined by their function and the function is directly associated with the protein in the cell. So the, the antibody, the surface markers, um, which you cannot directly correlate to the uh, mRNA, the gene expression within a cell. Instead, you need hundreds of genes to make the same kind of inference um, that you would get from a single protein. So that's, that's merging uh, that piece of information. And lastly, I also wanna merge in some meta information so this is gonna give us some parameters like the subject ID. You can see now that instead of 17 parameters, we have 22 analytical parameters and we have subject ID. So these, each of these lines indicates a different patient, which is pretty cool. Um, and we also have disease versus control. So you can see these are all of our uh, control healthy patients and these are all of our uh, diseased um, loop, uh, patients suffering from lupus. Um, and I think that's all I want to show with regard to the merging at this moment. Um, but I might dig in to uh, just perform a, a brief meta-analysis in which we'll run quality control that I had mentioned in that slide deck. Uh, in our newest version, we actually get, th we should have got three windows. Oh, here we go. And so you can see two of those windows are showing us uh, gene view, this one and this one. And in our uh, first dialogue, in our first graph window, we're actually seeing cells. And we're seeing in there uh, genes expressed per cell and the library size uh, per cell. And so in order to clean this up, I'm probably just gonna gate uh, very quickly on the uh, densest portion of this, removing anything that might be an outlier, and especially these uh, cells that are very, very high in both library cell and gene, uh, sorry, library size and genes expressed. And I'll call this quality cells. Cool. And this is the population that I would then use for further downstream analysis. You can see it's just a subset of our uh, initial matrix there. And then I'm gonna do some quality control on the the genes themselves, the parameters. And in this case, we know it's not all genes. We also have some flow data in there. And I'm probably gonna exclude that in the first gate that I, that I draw, I'll show you why. So in this case, um, the set of parameters that are generated by clicking this quality control button are cells expressing. So this is cells expressing per gene and then total reads per gene. So the number of cells that are expressing a given gene and just the total number of reads for that gene in the entire matrix. And typically we wanna look at this in the log versus log axes. So change the scaling a little bit. And then again, what we wanna remove are these, so there's a whole set of genes here that's just basically expressed for everyone. So they're gonna be very boring in terms of downstream clustering. So we probably want to remove them. This bit's a little bit arbitrary. We're looking at better ways to set, um, to know where to set this threshold. And then uh, at this point, it's more of an art than a science maybe. Uh, and then we also wanna remove the 
uh, very dimly expressing genes. So those that are uh, very lowly expressed here at the bottom, and we'll call this quality genes. Cool. Let's just move this a little closer to the diagonal. Um, actually, this diagonal line here represents uh, basically the maximum amount of um, amplification that was achieved for any given gene. So these might be considered like at the threshold of, um, of expression that we can detect for those given genes. Now that we've gated on a set of parameters and we maybe want to continue to perform uh, some more quality control on those genes, say in terms of variants which are closely related to dispersion. You can see I'm heading over to this window, um, but I don't want to lose the information that I gleaned from this filter. And so in our latest release, something that you can do is change the parameters that you're viewing within the gene view. So if I change from all genes to quality genes, now we're no longer looking at 30,000 parameters. Um, we're actually just looking at the 12,000 genes that we identified as quality genes or parameters that we identified as quality parameters. And you can see that kind of uh, takes the tail off of the cell expressing, uh, cells expressing parameter, which is now our x-axis. It was our y-axis here. Um, and again, what I mentioned is we want those genes that are highly variable. So more than, say, this bulk set of, uh, uh, of parameters that probably aren't um, telling us as much about the differences in these cells. And so I'm just going to draw a rectangle gate that kind of excludes that uh, main dense set of uh, parameters, and I'll call this um, COGS, or consistently overdispersed genes. Cool. So these are the genes that I'm going to begin doing my uh, further downstream analysis with, uh, or clustering. Um, you can see that every time we draw a gate in the gene set, instead of getting like a population that we would get from drawing a, uh, a gate on cell view, instead we get a gene set. So that's pretty handy to, to work out. And then uh, if we want to do, to do something like dimensionality reduction, we're going to select the population on which we want to run that and then go to the dimensionality reduction button here. And under methods, you'll see there's a variety of options. It uh, defaults to d T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, T SNE, but I actually want to do principal component analysis. Also in the latest release, we've implemented normalization and transformation, which are both really important in most cases for doing good clustering in especially the principal component first step. Uh, I have to select the genes that I want to do principal component analysis on. So this is where all that hard work finding the COGS comes in. And we're just going to add these almost 4,000 genes to the, the set. You can even scroll through these and look really quickly. Uh, I'm not seeing any flow parameters in there. That's because um, we excluded them as being very, very highly expressed uh, in the quality control gene sets. Okay, so once we've selected our, our genes of interest, we're ready to run principal component analysis. I'm going to let it uh, compute the first 25 principal components for me. And it'll give me a little preview of the variance that each of those principal components is going to contribute. <clears throat> Typically, you would look at a graph of this variance versus the rank uh, of the principal component. And you would draw a cutoff and, can, and only keep those principal components um, that contribute very, very high variance. Uh, I'm not seeing uh, a very clear um, drop off in the variance here, but I'll just take the first 12 principal components. Once I <clears throat> choose those and from the ones I want, it's going to give me back uh, again a preview of principal component one versus principal component two. And we can already start to see some really nice clustering in this global um, view of the data set, which is really cool to see. Of course, we want to get a little bit more in depth. And so we know that we want to go ahead and uh, take the next step and perform uh, TSNE, but not on those 4,000 quality uh, genes, or uh, COGS rather. Instead, we're going to run this on those principal component parameters that we just identified, so PCA. Some very nice filtering tools here in SeaGeek, so we can just immediately jump to those parameters of interest. And so you can see I've selected those dozen parameters that I just calculated. Uh, normally, I might up the iterations. Um, so there's some advanced settings that we can change for TSNE, but in this case, I'm just going to use the defaults uh, for the sake of time. And we should very shortly, um, you'll notice we've done some huge optimizations um, to the TSNE calculations. Uh, so we should very shortly get a TSNE mapping of that data. 
in uh, TSNE X versus TSNE Y. I think we call it TSNE Run 1 and TSNE Run 2 currently. And there it is. So now you can see we're getting even finer clustering, um, or shouldn't say clustering, but uh, finer resolution of the islands within this data set. Uh, again, something new to our, uh, our latest release, CK version 1.4, is a clustering tool. So if we wanted to go ahead and perform clustering on those same principal components, I can just click here. It opens up a clustering platform, and k-means is the first option selected. If we had labels that would help us to classify uh, our different cell types, perhaps, then the KNN classify would be a, a good option to use. But in this case, I'm just going to use the, the regular old k-means. K um, not going to change any defaults here, but I do want to make sure that I'm working with a condensed matrix. Um, it will tend to run a little bit better and a, and a bit faster using just these principal components, especially appropriate because we just did our mapping using, using the principal components. And I probably want to view these uh, predicted clusters in terms of uh, something I can visualize like that uh, TSNE mapping. So select that. And then I have to make a guess as to how many clusters are in there. And, I'm not sure. I'm going to go ahead and just guess eight. And then I'm going to run this unbiased method of clustering, which is now natively available um, in SeatGeek. And typically you would get back a set of eight different peaks here. Uh, it looks like maybe something went a little bit awry because I, I think I'm only getting two peaks there. And so I'm not going to go ahead and overlay that. But um, the next step I would typically take is to color the axis um, by that parameter. Instead, maybe we look at some of the flow data and see how those parameters look within this TSNE clustering. We might be able to start identifying things. So we can see maybe our, our leukocytes are here. We actually have a piece of meta information that might help us to confirm that. Those are the basically gating determining, uh, determined during flow cytometry between leukocyte and epithelial cells in this particular data set. So again, I'm going to color map the TSNE plot um, this time using a different anal analytical parameter, uh, specifically a categorical parameter, which is found here, type. So if anything has a type uh, that was not called, it'll fall into the, the bin of zero. If anything is epithelial, it'll be uh, given a value of one, so it'll be a little bit more green. And then anything that's leukocyte will be red. And so we can see kind of a, a close matching between CD45 and the leukocyte epithelial, epithelial gating that we were given by that meta information. That's pretty cool. Um, what if we wanted to identify, say, our B cells cluster? Um, don't know if anyone would hazard a guess as to which of these populations is our B cells. I would take a stab that maybe it's this guy out here. Uh, I actually have no idea. Each time you run TSNE, it's sort of a, a guessing game um, before you've done some, um, some kind of uh, characterization of the cells. Um, sometimes you can you can have an idea because of the, the number of cells in a given cluster. But let's look at our analytical parameters again, and this time we're going to choose CD19. Oh, and I was right. So typically B cells kind of stand out as being um, very much differentiated from the rest of the populations, and also um, they're going to be about this size. So it was a, a little bit of an educated guess on my part. Um, so that's kind of a typical... Um, really quick intro into um, how you might begin to analyze single cell RNA-seq data in SeqGeek. Um, and I hope if you guys have any questions, you'd feel free to, to post those onto the Q&A, but I'm not, I'm not seeing anything there or in chat at the moment. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Um, but before I go, I want to remind you that my email address is taylor at flojo.com. If you have any questions, if you want to set up a training, um, either a webinar or potentially a live training, um, feel free to write to me. Uh, definitely, if you have any questions, uh, put those to me. Uh, I'll be happy to work through it with you. Um, or write to seekgeekatflojo.com, and our tech support team will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, thanks so much for joining me. I uh, will see you at the next webinar. Bye now.